So verse 1 says, And Saul yet breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if any be found of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and the voice he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Let's pray before we get started. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we look into the Scriptures. I pray, Lord, that you'd lead me, your servant, in everything that I should say and not say. Lord, I pray that you'd convict hearts here of every sort. If there's someone here who needs to be saved, I pray that you'd show them their great need of salvation. And Lord, for those of us who are saved, I pray that this would be an encouragement to us, uh, that we would continue to be witnesses uh, for your great name's sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's read again verse 1. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Now as I read that, I can't help but think uh, that I should never hear anybody say that someone is beyond God's grace. I mean, nobody is hopeless while their heart beats within their breast. Of course, if they die without the Lord Jesus Christ, where the tree falleth, there it shall lie. It will be too late for them. But as long as they're taking breath and their heart is beating in their breast, there is hope for them. I mean, I need to look no farther than Saul. I mean, if you found the first century church and asked them if they thought that Saul would get saved... I doubt very many of them would think uh, that Saul would come to know Christ as their Savior. But he did. And I, found, I find that I've seen this, even in my few years of experience, I, I, I've seen this myself. I, I brought, you might say, well, so-and-so's a drunk. They'll never get saved. They'll never give up the, the booze bottle. Uh, they're a hopeless case. Well, I tell you what, I've seen the Lord save a hopeless case who was captured by the bottle. Uh, Brother Jack Wilkerson, my pastor, where I got saved at, uh, he uh, spoke often when he preached about his nine bad years. Nine bad years he was a drunkard. Nine bad years he treated his wife horribly and even cheated on her. But the Lord Jesus Christ intervened one day and saved his wretched soul and turned that man not only into a saint of God, but a preacher of his word. Amen. And I tell you what, I cannot think of a more godly person than Brother Jack. I've often said this, and I believe it to be true. I, uh, when it comes for somebody to pray for me, I'd rather had him pray for me than anybody. Except for the Holy Spirit and the Lord, of course. But anyways... It doesn't matter if they're drunker. Jesus Christ can save them. Here's a man breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. He held the coats in the previous chapter of those who stoned Stephen to death. But he was not such a sinner that Christ couldn't save him. I love what the Bible says. It says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Now, you might say, well, they're immoral. Oh, I've heard testimony after testimony of immoral people in whom the Lord Jesus Christ gloriously saved. Matter of fact, I need not look any further than the earthly minister of Christ himself. Oh, where he found, finds a woman there taken in the act of adultery. Huh? Y'all know the story. He writes in the sand. And after they pick up stones to try to stone her, he says, He that is out sin cast the first stone. 
And everybody drops their stones and walks away. But yet there's one still standing there who's without sin. There's one still standing there who could have slain her under the law. But he says, neither do I condemn thee. See, Christ did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save it. Now, if you die without Jesus Christ, it is because you neglected uh, being saved. You neglected the great gift given by the Father. He paid the way. He died for your sin. He paid for the sin of the whole world. Your unbelief is what would send you to hell. Christ died for you. He died for all sinners. He did tell her to sin no more after she after that event. And I tell you what, since Christ saved us, we should do our best to sin no more. Now ultimately, you will fail in that. But do not use that as an excuse. To live loosely. We should try earnestly with all our might to, and to, to abstain from sin and to live for Christ. You might say, well, they're a sodomite. Well, I tell you what, Christ died for sodomites too. He can save them just as much as he can save the drunkard and the harlot. No sin is outside of the scope and reach of the grace of God. Do you believe that or not? I mean, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. The Apostle Paul is writing to that church. They had so much turmoil and trouble inside of it. And he says, Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm glad that he didn't stop right there. That would have been some very bad news, would it not? I mean, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. But he goes on to say, and I love the next verse, it says, And su such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus uh, by, and by the Spirit of our God. They were those things, but Jesus Christ saved them. They are no longer adulterers. They are no longer effeminate. They are no longer abusers of themselves with mankind. Jesus Christ intervened. He made the difference. And by the way, backsliders, there's hope for you too. I mean, if you've gone away from God, lost fellowship with Him, you, you will not lose salvation once it's been given to you. It's eternal life. But if you've lost that relationship, if you've lost the fireworks of heaven springing out within your soul, there's hope for you. I think, I think I can look back to David. David was a man after God's own heart. David did a lot of things right. I, I think of him there as a young man watching the sheep writing a, a, a songs to praise the Lord. But one day after he'd been made king, he goes out on his rooftop, looks upon Bathsheba, and sin is conceived in his heart and the acts upon it. He seizes the young lady, commits adultery with her, and then he has her, his, her husband killed. Well, surely he's gone too far. Surely he's gone too far, you might say. But think about what David wrote in Psalm 51. There in the heading of verse 1 it says, The chief musician, the psalm of David, uh, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is what he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And you can read the rest of the psalm. He comes to the Lord with a contrite spirit. And the Lord did not despise him. The Lord forgave him. And the Lord will forgive you too. I don't think anybody's gone that far from God that I know right now who are Christians. But David surely did. I think about Peter who denied the Lord three times and went out and wept bitterly. 
the Lord uh, forgave him. And let him say three times, I love you, Lord, after that event. I love there at the, at the, uh, at the uh, stone when it was rolled away, the angel said, go tell his disciples and tell Peter also. There's forgiveness. I mean, I need not quote to you 1 John 1, 9, you know it. But let me quote it to you just in case. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let's get back to Saul of Tarsus though. Kind of got sidetracked there. But look at verse 2. It says, And talking of Saul, he desired of him, the high priest that is, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. These letters here that that uh, Saul is desiring from the high priest are pretty much what we would call arrest warrants. Warrants for anyone who has found any of this way. Now, my question for you as we read that verse is this. If Saul were alive today and gathering names and serving warrants, would you be safe? Would you be safe? Would he be coming after you? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, we kind of we get to the we get to the to uh, uh, confining our worship uh, just into the confines of these walls here. We 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 speak about Jesus here. We sing the songs here. We talk about Him here. But the problem is we don't talk about it out there. We need to go out there. You'll notice above our door it says you are now entering the mission field. You are. We think of the mission field as being England, Africa, all these other places, but we are also in a mission field. Did not Jesus in his great commission say uh, Jerusalem and Judea? That's where they were. But he does extend it past that, he says, into the uttermost part of the world. But don't neglect here. People need the Lord here. I'd say you wouldn't have to walk very far down the street to find somebody dying and going to hell. Matter of fact, I know there is. We've knocked on these doors through. There's plenty of people here who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to live that life here. We need to open our mouths and witness here so people know it. So you should be as someone who saw what it came after. You should be of this way. What is this way? One of them Christians. One of those people that talk about the Lord. One of those people who sing about the Lord. Somebody of this way. Somebody who knows their Bible. Huh? Someone that's making a ruckus in this wicked world. I'm afraid all the ruckuses are being started by all the ungodly folks and not by the Christians. All the big mouth, loud mouths are all unbelievers. We need some Christians to lift up their voice like a trumpet and show people their transgressions and show people that there is a way of salvation. Would you even be on Saul's radar? It was a few weeks ago I was preaching on Joseph and I was talking about how uh, Potiphar's wife came day by day and tempted uh, Joseph. And we spoke about the devil. He is a, our adversary. He's like a roaring lion. He also, day by day, will try to cause us to stumble in our walk with the Lord. And the devil surely is after people who are doing his work. He was after Joseph, for one. There's enough evil in the world, but I tell you what, I believe he zeroes in on people who are doing his work because the devil is a destroyer, isn't he? He come to steal, kill, and destroy. He can't have your soul, Christian, but he can have your testimony. So I tell you what, you better keep your eyes open. You better walk, walk circumspectly. You be, better be aware of the devil's devices. And if you have any weak points, Christian, you need to shore them up. You need to be on the devil's radar. If not, shame on you. 
The roaring lion, too. I think about a roaring lion. A roaring lion's out in the prairie. He's laying in wait for a gazelle, is he not? Do you never see a lion chasing after a little mouse? I don't want to be a spiritual mouse. I want to be great game. I want to be a, a doing something for the Lord. Most Christians today, though, are undercover. Huh? Is that the way Christians are now? I mean, they go around outside like they're an undercover agent for the Lord. And if they happen to find out that there's another Christian around, they may share that they're undercover and say, look here, I'm a Christian too. But all the lost people all to see that you're a, a Christian too. Their language ought to change when you walk into the room. And when uh, they uh, curse, they should probably say, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. It's not as though we're so fragile that we could not hear a curse word and not shriek and, and crumble to the ground. Uh, but it shows that they have respect and that we're living the life out there. But you know what? Most Christians don't have the spirituality to blow the fuzz off a peanut. I tell you, if Saul was looking for someone to rest, it ought to be us. Amen. Let's look at verse 3. It says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And given his testimony later, Paul would tell us it was high noon. Over in chapter 22, verse 6, and chapter 26, verse 13. Uh, as the candle uh, pales before the morning sun, so now the noonday sun paled to the glory light that burst upon astonished Saul when he was knocked from his horse there at Damascus. The Lord is the light. Jesus is the light. Light exposes darkness. Light disperses darkness. And here Saul's darkness is about to be dispersed. Only Jesus can do that, folks. But look, let's look a little bit further. Verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul here was knocked off of his high horse, as I like to say. I mean, he was a Pharisee, and we know the attitude of the Pharisees. Uh, Paul would later write about it and say that, the, that they were going about to establish their own righteousness and not submitting themselves to the righteousness of Christ. They like to boast about what they had done for the Lord. But here we see uh, uh, Saul knocked off his horse. God showed him that he's vile. He's not all that he thinks he is. And that's what happens, needs to happen to every lost sinner. Before someone can be saved, they must be lost. Now, I know all lost people are lost. Everybody's not been saved, they're lost. Uh, but in their minds, they need to know that they're sinners. I mean, I, I hate this type of Christianity uh, that all it does is go around rubbing people's shoulders and saying, you're all right, you're all right. Be your best you. Huh? That's not biblical Christianity at all. Read Romans. It's not very long. And when you start reading the book of Romans, you get to chapter 3, and it says there's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to know we're sinners. <coughs> he gets knocked down from his high horse. By the way, God uses these tactics a lot. I think about Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, he was a, a, a great king in history. Now, I don't, I'm not talking about his quality of his kingship. I'm talking about his power. He had great power. Uh, he uh, come to realize, or, or thought he realized this, and, I, and one day out in his courtyard he said, look at great Babylon which I have built, which I have done, which I, I kept using the word I. And God brought him down low, didn't he? He was a great and mighty tree, but he was cut down. I think of Belshazzar having his great and grand party. When God became the party pooper and wrote on the back of the wall, meaning, meaning, tickle you farson. Among other things, meaning your kingdom's been weighed in the balances and found wanting. 
In essence, that's what God does here uh, to uh, Saul of Tarsus. You've been weighed in the balance of Saul, and you're found wanting. That's what he does to every sinner, isn't it? You can't save yourself. Salvation is not of blood, it's not by our, our birthright, it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. Nicodemus, a very righteous, a very religious man, Jesus says you must be born again. Why? He was born wrongly the first time. Beware lest this happen to you. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Don't get prideful, even as a Christian. If you ever think that you've arrived spiritually, get ready to fall off your high horse or get knocked off of it. A haughty spirit brings a fall. But I think this is very interesting. He says, why persecutest thou me, talking to Saul? Now Jesus had already been crucified. He'd already risen from the dead. And he had ascended from Mount Olivet and was sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And we see him even there in the previous chapter because when Stephen was stoned, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand. So what is Jesus talking about here? Why is he saying, why are you persecuting me? Well, Christ is the head of the church. So when the church is persecuted, so is he. Right? Right? You cannot torture me without it affecting my head. One part of the body hurts, all of the body hurts. And Christ is the head. I think about this when I think of the judgment of nations over in Matthew chapter 25, verses 42 through 45. Listen to what Jesus says there. He said, For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they uh, also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thence hungered, or thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he, shall, then he answered them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Now he's talking about the negative there. If you didn't do it to these, you didn't do it to me. But likewise, if you do it to him, it does, he also do it to him. The head suffers with the body. So he was persecuting the church. He wasn't just persecuting Christianity. He was persecuting Christ himself. Verse 5 says, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. This must have hit Saul very hard. After all, he was a religious Jew. He had uh, uh, read and heard his whole life about the Messiah who would come. The one who would come and set up an everlasting kingdom. The one who would destroy the yoke they had hoped of the Romans. He was longingly looking for the Messiah, no doubt, to come. And he had missed him. And not only that, he was trying to undo the work that Christ was doing. But I tell you, friends, you can't undo the work of Christ, no matter how hard you try. Gamal even got that right. He said, if it's be a God, you can't stop it. Saul was trying to stop it, but I tell you, he was just spinning his wheels, wasn't he? But I'm sure that broke his heart. He even says later on that he was a zealous person. And he thought he was doing right, but he wasn't. But I will tell you this, it's not an excuse to think you're doing right and do wrongly. Wrong's wrong and right's right. But let's move on. Evidently God had been dealing with him already. Because of what Jesus said here. He said it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now the picture here is of an ox being poked with a goad. I don't know if you know what a goad is, but that's a sharp stick. So if the ox is not doing what it's supposed to do, the farmer gets that sharp stick, pokes him in the rear end, tries to get him to move and do what he's supposed to do. And but if you have a stubborn thing like a donkey, 
You might poke that donkey over and over again, and the stubbornness of that donkey, he'd just kick against the pricks. He'd just kick against the one trying to poke him. Evidently, God had been dealing with him and pricking him. I no doubt his heart had to be pricked while he held the coats of Stephen. Because Stephen preached the word of God and he preached it with the power of the Spirit behind it. No doubt his heart was pricked there. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, he did what a lot of sinners do today. When conviction comes, they just harden their necks and get angry. I'm telling you right now, the church is a place where your toes ought to get stepped on every once in a while. If your toes do not get stepped on, there's a problem somewhere, either with the preacher or with your own heart. But I tell you what, most of the time it's going to be your heart. You're not listening. You're not open. You've got too much of the world's din uh, bouncing around in your brain. Ask the Lord to speak to you and He will. Isn't he a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? Amen. Ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's what the scriptures say. Many today are kicking against the pricks. God's trying to goad our country back in the right direction. Uh, but much of our country is kicking against the one goading them. There's fiery serpents that have been let loose in our country. But instead of seeking God's fates, we've just suffered with them. Stop kicking against God. He's trying to teach you something. If there's something coming in your life, He allowed it there. And He allowed it there for a reason. God does not do anything without reason. Verse 6. It says, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And I tell you what, I could preach that sermon again. I love that sermon. Probably if I had a, a great group of people to preach to, I would probably preach from that text. What would thou have me to do? If you're lost, he'd have you to be saved. If you're saved, he'd have you to ask that question. Because God's hard up for workers. He ain't got many people in this generation. We're a perverse generation, aren't we? We're like the generation of, of, uh, of the flood. Men's hearts are on wickedness continually. People are eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Meaning they're not thinking about God, they're doing everything else. But we need some people to say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He would have you to do his work. He'd have you to do those basic things. Which are right here in his word. Those basic things. We have such trouble with the basic things. We have such trouble praying the way we ought to pray. We have such trouble reading the Bible the way we ought to read the Bible. And we wonder why God doesn't give us more to do. Do those base things. Do those things you know you do. I have people sometimes come to me and say, I want to do this or I want to do that. And it's usually something big that they want to do. But... First, you've got to be found faithful before you have those things. But listen to what he says. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. First thing Jesus says, when he says, What will thou have me to do? He says, Arise and go. Go. This is the advice that God gives oftentimes, is it not? Here in a little bit, he's going to tell Ananias to go somewhere. Go. He's telling him to go to a city. But wasn't it uh, too long ago in his earthly ministry, he was telling the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go. He wants you to go. Here we see specific directions given on where he should go. Not a lot of details are given. Just the city, but Paul goes. Sometimes we don't get the whole plan of God. Uh, but uh, we're to trust and obey anyway. You know that song has a lot of truth to it. Trust and obey, for there's no other way 
to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. If you can get those two things right, it will transform your life. Trust Him no matter what and obey Him. How many Christians have gotten sidetracked because they couldn't just do those small, small two things, trusting and obeying? Then verse 7, we go, let's move on. It says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. They heard the noise of talking, if you'll uh, read later on Paul's accounts. They don't seem to have heard the words. They just heard the sound of, of the voice. It was I, uh, I mean, you can look up all the Greek and all that stuff. I'm not going into all that stuff. But they heard a sound, but they did not hear the particular words. God was speaking here to Saul. And I hope that these men uh, did trust the Lord, but the Bible doesn't talk about them trusting the Lord. But after what they had an opportunity there. I think about people who had great opportunities to be saved and missed it. Judas Iscariot has to top the list, doesn't he? For three and a half years at least, Judas Iscariot heard the wonderful words of life preached by Jesus Christ. He saw the miracles firsthand. But the whole time he's stealing from the bag. The whole time he's just worried about money. I mean, even on the, the mount, I mean, even when the, the woman came in with the alabaster box of ointment, his mind couldn't get off the money, could it? Why was it just taken and sold and given to the poor? And he says he didn't care about the poor. But he held the bag. He brought, bought that field where he killed himself with the price of blood. That was not the money that he, that he uh, got from the priest to betray the Lord. No. He threw that back at their feet, did he not? The price of iniquity is what he'd been stealing the whole time. What a terrible thing to walk with the Lord three and a half years. Hear those words and say no. What about Barab uh, Barabbas? I mean, if he didn't get saved, what a fool he is. I mean, Christ literally took his place. Actually, he took our places too, though. You'd be foolish not to trust him. But anyways, uh, he was speaking here particularly, and God does that. He speaks to different people at different times. I mean, I think about, what is it, Hebrews chapter 1, God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, happened these last days spoken to us by his son. Diverse times and different ways. But anyways, let's move on. Verse 8. And Saul rose from the earth, and his eyes were opened, and he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Here we see his spiritual condition mirrored by his physical condition. Saul had been made blind. The lost world is blind. He was blind before Christ spiritually. Now he's blind physically. Uh, the lost person is blind. And we read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, uh, uh, gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. They're blind. A lost sinner is incapable of perceiving uh, their own wretchedness. And I think that's where Paul was. He was a Pharisee trying to establish his own righteousness. A lost person is blind to the danger they're in. At any moment, your, your mortal life could end. And you can lift up your eyes in hell. If you're not saved, that's a dangerous place to be. I mean, I like the way the old preacher uh, used to preach. Oh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, he'd say, hey, you're walking over hell on a rotten covering. At any moment, you could hit that weak spot. Yes. Your mortality is a thinless, slender thread that could be broken in an instant. It's fragile. But lost people many times are blind to that. They'll say, I got tomorrow. I got the rest of my life. But just like the man Jesus told about who had the great harvest and he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. God said, today thy soul shall be required of thee. A blind man is lost. I mean, a spiritually blind man too doesn't know what he's missing out on. 
I tell you what, they, they, they find such pleasure in the world. But those pleasures are nothing compared to the peace and the pleasure there is in serving uh, our God. Most people are blind to that. So I believe this uh, physical condition here he had for a time mirrored the spiritual condition he had prior. Verse 9 it says, And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now we see once again the saint of God's readiness to serve. The Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and you know what Ananias said? Behold, I am here, Lord. How many times does God look down and say to you, where are you? It's time for you to say, here I am, Lord, send me where you want me to go. That's what Ananias did. It's just like Philip in the previous chapter when he was uh, caught to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. It says he ran. He was eager to do the will of God. Verse 11 it says, And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Once again we see arise and go. Will you arise and go? Notice, too, that uh, Saul, while he was waiting on the Lord to show him the next step, what is he doing? He's praying. Isn't that an, a great example? You may not know where your next step in life is going to lead, but pray till then. And then pray again until you find the next one. And then pray again until the Lord shows the next one. Prayer is a daily thing. Give us today our daily bread, Jesus said. Verse 12, and it says, And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in to put his hand on him that he might receive his sight. When Saul prayed, God showed him what he should do. Right there in verse 12. Verse 13, And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man which how much evil he hath done to the saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now think about this. This was a dangerous situation for the Lord to send Ananias into. Often God puts us into situations that don't make sense to us. Why does God want me to go talk to this guy who's arresting people and holding the coats of the people who are throwing rocks at them? Why does he want me to go talk to this man who's breathing out threatenings and murders against the church? But you know what? We just need to go and trust God. I mean, there's missionaries called the countries uh, where they can be killed. There's underground churches in China there's Muslim countries who burn Christians in cages. God calls you somewhere, trust Him. Sometimes our circumstances seem unreasonable to us, but God has a plan. And God's plan don't always make sense to us. Because His ways are above our ways and His thoughts are above our thoughts. I couldn't imagine being in the Israeli army when God told them to march around the walls of Jericho and yell. But when they did so, what happened? The walls fell down flat. So things may not make sense to us, but let's just trust God. God lets Ananias in on his plan. However, sometimes our, he doesn't let us in on the plan. What do we do in that situation? We just trust him. Do you need to trust him today? Let's pray.